Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Tonight, I'm going to continue my Haruki Murakami series with the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen uh, any of the other videos, basically what I'm doing here is I am responding to a lot of my friends uh, and other acquaintances who have been telling me for years upon years, actually uh, probably a good decade or two that I need to read Haruki Murakami and I've always just put it off um, I'm not really sure why it's just someone I had never gotten around to so starting last year I decided to read through all of his books uh, or at least all of his novels for right now in order of original publication in Japan uh, this one was originally published in three volumes in Japan in 1994 and 1995 and then this um, is the translation um, sort of an authorized translation, uh, translation with Jay Rubin, uh, who worked with Haruki Murakami on this translation. I have heard from some people that this may be an abridged version. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that. This one, uh, the U.S. version, was originally published in 1997. I'll just go ahead and set the stage for, for anyone who doesn't know. I'm not exactly like a gushing Murakami fan. I'm not a hardcore um, fan of Murakami. Um, but, you know, I plan, I'm, I'm continuing to give all of his books a fair read. I'm also, you know, not uh, someone who's, you know, who hates him or hates his books by any means. In fact, um, it's kind of funny because the one book of his that I've read so far that I was very, very impressed with is the very book that it seems like all Murakami fans despise and that is Norwegian Wood. And the only thing I can come up with to explain that so far is that Norwegian Wood lacks that magical realism, um, those fantasy elements that all of the other books so far have had. Um, and so maybe maybe I'm more drawn to that, but there again, um, you know, I like a lot of other magical realism. I love uh, Garcia Marquez and and, uh, and others, and we'll talk about that more at the end. But in any case, I have to say that I quite liked this novel. It was very entertaining. Um, and I do think that if I had come to Murakami earlier in my life, I think I would have been a much bigger fan. I could definitely see myself loving these novels um, if I had discovered them um, uh, a long time ago. Um, and take that however you will. Um, even Murakami himself in an interview with The New Yorker said that he's more of a hit with late teens, um, early 20s, um, and most of the people who are older reading him are the ones that came to him at that time. Um, and I was the same way with a lot of other uh, writers. And again, I think this is just a natural prog progression of things. I'm in no way trying to glorify myself and say, you know, that uh, I'm older and more distinguished and I've read, you know, such uh, other great literature that there's no way I can stoop to this level. Nothing like that. I think this is honestly just a natural progression of things. Um, it's just the, the more you discover, uh, the more selective you get. You know, you start to realize what you're drawn to and you also begin to realize that your free time, your leisure time is shrinking. And so you get more selective um, because you don't want to take chances as much and, and waste that time. Um, and you know, and even that can, can burn you. For example, when uh, Thomas Pynchon's book, uh, last book came out, The Bleeding Edge, I got super excited because I'm a huge Pynchon fan. And, uh, and then I was very disappointed by The Bleeding Edge. So <laughs> it doesn't always work. Uh, but in any case, uh, I also think that you know there's there's something special that locks in when you discover a novelist early on um, who does something you haven't seen before. Um, and so we you know we could go on and on and talk about this, but let's talk about the book and and how um, in my view of it. Honestly, uh, like I said, I've read all of the preceding six novels that he's put out uh, that he put out before this one, and I honestly think that in the Wind Up, Wind Up Bird Chronicle, that this is finally the book that he had been wanting to write all along. Um, now, of course, the caveat here is that you know we're I'm not, I'm kind of putting Norwegian Wood to the side because that was it's just something totally different. Um, but I feel like this is finally like he he found his footing, he found his rhythm. Um, he all the all the other novels seem like rough drafts of this one, and he finally struck gold, um, and it kept my interest all the way through. There were times when I cringed because I felt 
like, oh no, he's he's getting ready to do the same kind of stuff that I didn't really like from others, like the use of Deus Ex Machina in Dance, Dance, Dance with the girl Yuki, um, where, you know, she just starts feeling sick in a car and then all of a sudden she just blurts out kind of the answer to everything. And it just really was a slight to the reader. Um, but there's none of that in here. Um, everything is well crafted, well thought out, well connected. Um, which is which is really a treat um, during this time of quarantine, um, and I really just wanted something cathartic, you know, to to dive into a different world. And One Up Bird Chronicle it did that for me. It's definitely a Haruki Murakami novel. Like I've said in other videos, it seems like we get the same narrator, um, a normal but somewhat listless guy who just wants to read books and drink coffee and make spaghetti and listen to jazz and classical music. Um, and he gets a strange phone call, meets an enigmatic young girl. Um, there's a weird sort of uh, relationship that happens, kind of reminded me of the, the main character and Yuki from Dance 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 that's a little uh, off-putting. This guy gets pulled in deeper and deeper into a secret web of time and consciousness bending forces within which he becomes the key to unlocking the fate and meaning of his life and others. Toru Okada is the narrator in here and I wondered if this Toru were the same Toru as Norwegian Wood. But anyway, in this book, this is the perfect character, the perfect narrator um, for us to immediately latch onto and live vicariously through because he's 30 years old, he's uh, willingly unemployed, he quit his job and he doesn't need to work. Instantly right there you've got my attention because uh, eventually <laughs> we all fantasize about what it would be like to just quit and not really do anything and especially not have to do anything. Um, he's a homebody, he's reading, he's having deep ontological and epistemological thoughts that of course will play into the novel. I mean you could think of this novel as just simply a dream. Another thing that makes this character work is that he's constantly uh, insisting upon concrete facts in the face of all these fantastic elements and so of course that keeps us grounded so that at least for people like me who I can't just get completely captivated by totally fantastic things you know I've got to have but I've got to be grounded in realism and that's the that's the beauty of magical realism um, as May Kashahara says you're such a super normal guy, but you do such unnormal things. Because, and that's a great description of Toru, because he's just this normal, you know, concrete facts type guy, but he just kind of opens himself up to whatever and just kind of goes along, goes along with this and that. Um, and then the character Ushikawa says, you're basically a really ordinary guy, or to put it even more bluntly, there's absolutely nothing special about you. The plot, how in the world do I sum up the plot? Well, I, uh, this is the best I can do right here. Toru is making spaghetti and listening to Rossini, and an intrusive caller keeps annoying him with propositions for phone sex. I mean, how annoying is that, guys? Then he goes out and searches for his wife's missing cat. Then his wife goes missing. Then more elusive callers contact him. Then he meets a quirky and lively young girl. Then yet another woman invades his consciousness. Then he ends up in a well. Then he gets a strange, bluish, bruise-like mark on his cheek. Then another girl kisses it. Then a mysterious woman gives him a lot of money. Another woman, maybe the mysterious one, licks the mark on his cheek. Characters disappear and reappear. The well becomes a key to resolving the whole thing. There are so many threads going on um, that I did get worried that we were going to have major glaring plot holes. Um, you know, as I was getting down to the last 100 pages, the last 50 pages, he had spun so many threads all over the place that I thought to myself, he set himself up for failure. There's no way he can give a satisfying ending. And while the ending isn't mesmerizing, in fact, there is on some, somewhere around like page three, 535, there's this great suggestive twist to just throw one more little wrench in there um, and keep us going until the end. Some of the themes, um, it's classic Murakami as far as I can tell. Um, again, setting aside Norwegian Wood, it's what is real? What is reality? How can we really know a thing? Um, I can't remember when the term qualia 
was identified, but I think it was David Chalmers um, defined it, and it talks about how we each experience a thing in our consciousness in its own way. There's a lot of that in here. Um, consciousness, the subconscious, or the unconscious, conscious as it says in this book, but you know, the, there's a lot about the subconscious, the well, room 208, and so on. Um, there's uh, the symbol of water as, as flow, um, which you know gets into time and subconscious and all kinds of other things. Um, and of course, wells feature uh, prominently in here. Really, um, I kept finding myself thinking that this would be a psychoanalytic literary critic's dream book. There's a lot about love versus desire and how um, how you can keep the two alive, especially within the bounds of a marriage, um, when desire is the you know absence of something fulfilled. Um, how do you keep desire alive um, and yet fulfill each other's needs at the same time? How do you keep the mystery alive when at the same time you need to really you're compelled to know everything about each other? Human interconnectedness. Um, now, interestingly, uh, Haruki Murakami uncharacteristically brings in scenes from Japan's invasion of and later campaigns with Manchuria um, and also the, the Russo-Japanese conflict, um, scenes from World War II that I wasn't really uh, familiar with or, or history from World War II um, in the Far East that I wasn't um, familiar with and use that to tie into human interconnectedness in a really interesting way. Generational curses and houses with lingering presences from these conflicts, um, which is such a Japanese thing. Um, I think of the, let me just think of the movie The Grudge. Um, and I'm starting to understand how Haruki Murakami brings these Japanese sentiments into a Western writing style and Western culture, f cultural flavor. In the third act, things really um, change with the prose style and the form that he uses. He uses, um, he, instead of this just straight first person narration from Toru, we sudden, suddenly turn into a mix of techniques that are serialized and intertwined. So there's this kind of serialized newspaper article section. There's a third person narrative of a young boy and we find out who that is later. There are these wartime flashbacks. There are letters from May, Kashahara, and then there's Nutmeg's story. Um, and then of course still the first person narration with Toru and but they're all serialized and intertwined. Now what this does, it actually slows the pace down. So we're in the third act when we should be wrapping up, but it slows the pace down a little bit. Um, Murakami wants to take us a bit deeper. Um, and then it also works to build tension because he keeps giving us this cliffhanger on each of the serials, of these serialized sections. And it also delays the conclusion. So I have to say that all in all, um, it's a wild book. It's all over the place, dreamlike. Um, is is a great way. I mean, that's right here on the on the copy on the front from Chicago Tribune. Tribune. Um, the first word is dreamlike, and it really is. I mean, the whole thing is possibly a dream, maybe not. Um, it doesn't really matter because he Murakami has sat down and said, you know what? I'm just going to give it everything I've got, um, and it actually works. It was it's, it's cohesive. Um, it's bewildering. Uh, but in, in a really good way. Um, and he's constantly using these different symbols, the wind-up bird, um, the thieving magpie from Rossini, the well, of course, um, the scar. But he's using all these things and keeps things pinned together. One thing reading through these Murakami novels has done for me is it has exposed some of my own contradictory predispositions as a reader. For every single thing that I have found that I don't like about a Murakami novel, I can think of a rejoinder from something I do like. And what I mean by that is, for example, um, not in this book, and, but in some previous books, Hard Boiled Wonderland and The End of the World, I find myself getting weary by the overwriting. And by that I mean it's just a, it was a lot of words and a lot of narration just to move a character from one place to another without anything very intrinsic to the plot taking place. It felt like um, when 
uh, movies put in things for padding to get that runtime so they can call themselves a feature. Um, but then how to explain my love for novel explosives, which prides itself on Pleonas mundanity or ordinariness uh, has irked me here and there. Um, but then how to explain my love for Karl Ove Knuska, dull, listless, laissez-faire narrator. How could this trouble me though when I think about Albert Camus' character in L'Etranger? Strange interactions and thoughts and exchanges between a very, very young girl and a much older guy, such as between the narrator and Yuki in Dance, 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 and here between Mei and Toru. But how in the world can I be so thrilled with Lolita? And at one point, I thought to myself, maybe I haven't taken uh, to Murakami because it just feels so much like all he's doing is sitting and just making things up haphazardly and then, you know, piecing it all together. But even if he were, first of all, isn't that fiction? But then how to explain something like my, my love for you bright and risen angels? So yes, it has helped to lay bare um, the fact that perhaps there has been this predisposition um, on my part as a reader that I'm bringing to each text before I even give it a chance. Um, now some of it is just is bad. It's objectively bad. But I don't want to be one of those people um, who, you know, compare some of those books that I've just mentioned necessarily with Murakami because this is apples to oranges. So that's why I've just thought of them in terms of elements of writing. And when it comes down to it, I have to say that I think um, it's simply the fact that all of the books leading up to this one, like I said at the beginning of the, of the video, have been sort of rough drafts or attempts at finally achieving the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. So again, I actually liked this one. I was enthralled with it from start to finish. Um, you know, it's just a great, great, entertaining, engrossing read. It doesn't have writing aesthetic that I look for, but it doesn't need it. That's not what this book is about. This is plot, 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 plot. Just to stir up all of the fans of Murakami, if nothing else, I still like Norwegian Wood even better than this one.